I'm going to be talking about pairing health and drug discovery with genotype and phenotype data. This is the type of data we deal with mostly at 23andMe. Um, and uh, phenotype data, I'll get into what I mean by that a little bit later. Uh, a little bit of why I joined 23andMe. I, um, it's a company that uh, I have always kind of admired and it, in, in many ways it brings together uh, my past experiences and my background in both computation uh, and then biology. Uh, so I've always sort of ad admired what they do. Um, and also it was an opportunity for me to learn uh, because it's a consumer company as well as a, th a newly therapeutics company. So we have a thing that we sell to people. We go to shops and we, it's available in shops or, or it was, it no longer is, but you buy it on Amazon or you order online and you, you know, you send us a sample. So we deal with consumers directly, which is something I'd never done before. And on the other side, we're also a therapeutics company and we develop drugs. So I'll get into that. Uh, so I will talk about, uh, this is a bit of an agenda, you know, overview of what our product is, what, what we do in research at 23andMe, and then uh, powering our research infrastructure and data science. Uh, the other thing I was sort of drawn to and, and, and has kept me at 23andMe so far is that uh, our CEO, Anne, she really uh, stresses this, this mission of ours is that is to help people access, understand, and benefit from the human genome. The access and understand, I think, speaks to our product or consumer product, uh, but also the benefit comes from partly our product, but also the therapeutics end of our business where we use that data to look through you know, the genetics of millions of people and look for targets for therapeutics. So a little bit of highlights of the company itself, uh, what we sold over 10 million kits. So we have around that much genotypic data uh, in our database. Uh, we collect a lot of data on uh, surveys, which we call, this is what we call our phenotype data. So we send out surveys on your, uh, you know, on health uh, questions, simple questions around, you know, do you run? What do you eat? Or more medically relevant questions, do you have high blood pressure? Um, do you have Parkinson's disease? So we ask a lot of questions. I think we have thousands of questions that a user can answer which is critical to the work that we do, because then we use that against your genotype data. Um, I'll talk more about how we do that analysis. Uh, we published over 150 peer-reviewed journal articles, and we're the only FDA-authorized direct-to-consumer genetic testing kit, um, and also our health reports, which I will talk more about, um, are FDA-authorized. Uh, a segment of them are FDA-authorized. And interestingly, 80% of our consumers participate in research. So they directly consent to research. Um, they are also able to extract their consent at any point in time. And California law requires that. Uh, you know, you've probably seen some of our ads. This is what it looks like. We have two offerings. One is our ancestry service. So you, you can see what part of the world you're from. Uh, and who you're related to. And another one is our Ancestry Plus Health, which uh, there's a lot of reports on health um, and more focused on prevention and you know, needing to see your doctor if you've got something to, you need to think about. Uh, so how it works, and, and this is really weird because I can't see the audience. So this is the first time I'm doing a Zoom talk, I think. So uh, you know, I, I can't see you. You can't unfortunately interrupt and ask me questions, but I'm hoping I'll get a sense of that after. Uh, so how this all works is you order online, you spit into a tube, and I've done this too, you send it through the mail, and then you look up on your app or uh, a web uh, portal on uh, what your results are showing. So that's how the product itself works. Our demographics, we have more women than men. Uh, we've got a split of most of the customers are in the US, followed next by Canada, and I'm always very proud of that. 
Um, and Canada is our, I think, one of the fastest growing markets that we have. So that's always nice. Uh, median age is there. We have a, we follow our consumers very close. We have a lot of metrics and um, data on who our users are, how they use the app, how they use the website. And that for me has been really interesting because it's something that I hadn't seen before precisely because I'd never worked on a consumer side of anything. But we, uh, 23andMe really does a really deep job of following the metrics of all our consumers. Was there a question there? Okay, sorry, I thought I heard something. So a little bit more about our product. We have 10 plus health predisposition reports, and this is an area where we're putting a lot more emphasis now. And this is very much of the times with COVID-19, uh, with that, you know, I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for the digital health uh, world, uh, as it is for pharmaceuticals and anyone developing vaccines or therapeutics, but it's also a time where you know, if you can avoid going to the doctor or going to a hospital at this time, it's probably best. So how can the digital health sector step up? Uh, there's opportunities there. So how can we provide that information, um, those guidelines, additional information to our users? There's 40 plus carrier status reports, traits, like what, what's your eye color? Are your earlobes attached? Do you have a widow's peak? Uh, wellness, um, and then lots of information on ancestry. So this is like a deep dive on what people learn from health and ancestry. These are all the reports we have, and we, this is a little bit older. I think we have more than that now. But you know, we have reports on cancer to Parkinson's to Alzheimer's. Some of the more sort of scary ones you can turn off; you don't have to see them. Uh, but you know, I think a lot of these we look at if there's an opportunity for uh, our users to go and get tested because they know they have a marker for something, then that's a good thing. Um, some of the other ones are just fun and we just add them in just so it's a better consumer experience. Like, you know, can you match musical pitch, for example? Are you afraid of speaking in, in, in public? Uh, so we look for markers for all of those things that could be considered more on the traits um, or maybe even getting to more on the wellness side like alcohol intolerance, muscle composition, things like that. And then much more serious types of um, health, uh, uh, type of uh, reports. Uh, this is just sort of a, a little bit of a, a recap of what we talked about. Um, it's, it's really the genotype and phenotype information from our consumer product that powers our research and fills this database that we base our research on. It is the research, it is this data that has resulted in collab the, the, our main pharmaceutical collaboration with GSK. So GSK and, and us, we have, a, a, I, I believe, a four-year uh, collaboration where we're looking for targets and we work on programs jointly uh, to develop drugs. This was actually the reason why I, I uh, became very interested in joining the company because I felt that uh, this is exactly what 23ME should be doing. This is exactly the right thing for a company that is sitting on this rich genetic data that they they have the infrastructure to store and manage and analyze. Um, how do we use that for developing drugs? Uh, it's uh, the research program is all opt-in. Everything we use in research is IRB approved or in Canada is called REB approval. Um, and then everything is consent based and um, the customers can uh, sort of remove their participation at any time. We spend a lot of time in infrastructure making sure that we can delete or retrieve data from our databases um, where there is a customer request. Um, sample ancestry report, you know, I'm not going to spend time on these. This is basically telling you based on genetics data, um, and we sort of can analyze, we have uh, some algorithms, which I'll go into a little bit later on um, where are you from, who are you related to. Um, and the sample genetic health risk reports look like this. And for example, are, you know, are you susceptible to late onset Alzheimer's? We look at some markers, we don't look at all the markers. And so uh, we try to communicate that clearly that you know, even if we say you, you may not have an increased risk, you still might. Um, so with that background, 
that's what our product is. Uh, you know, this is why we uh, we're collecting data. We store. We think about what we collect, um, and we make sure that everyone everything is transparent about uh, participation in research studies. We have a big research team, uh, and we have some really great researchers on our research team looking through this data and thinking about how to analyze it and how can we return value both to the product to make the consumer experience more interesting, but also how do we um, use that, the research outcomes for our therapeutics business. Um, another point here is that about 75% of our customers answer these survey questions. Um, so that, that is the critical thing for us. I think the genotype data is great, but I think one of our core assets is actually this phenotypic data. We have thousands and thousands of phenotypes that we, and we have hundreds of thousands of responses to all of these phenotypes. And I, I, will, I will show later why that is a little bit, it is important. So where you have a large database, you have significant disease cohorts. So for example, for Alzheimer's, we have over 1.2 to five million people in our database that um, have a, the APOE carrier, that, that are the carriers. Uh, over one million people with depression. Um, you know, you can see the numbers here. So this gives us uh, volume for the analysis that we try to run. And this allows us to collaborate with researchers, with companies uh, that are interested in studying these specific areas. We also, you know, we, we, we published a lot. Uh, this is one of our publications um, where we're looking at depression and, you know, we, we, we use data from over 800,000 individuals. So these are some of the largest studies that we can do um, in this space and we're able to identify markers. And as a result, it, it could lead to identifying targets for drugs uh, or different approaches uh, for therapeutics. So um, I think this is one of the, the things that I get excited about at 23andMe is the types of research that uh, we're able to do uh, and the types of partnerships that we can have. Uh, this is a, a, a quote from Ewan Ashley, who's a professor at Stanford, uh, that you know, they have quietly become the largest genetic study the world has ever known. It, and we take these things seriously. We take, uh, we, we try to focus on what is uh, relevant, where we can add value scientifically, and we try to base uh, everything we do on, um, on science. So for example, the COVID-19 situation, we've been thinking a lot about how do we contribute? We don't wanna just put out something that isn't meaningful. There's a lot of companies in the Bay Area scrambling to put something out. Uh, we know there's a big market out there, but we, we are actually trying to be as thoughtful as possible about how do we contribute scientifically to this? How do we look through our database and look for markers? Um, but we haven't asked any phenotypic questions per se that are relevant to COVID-19. We've asked maybe about hypertension. We've asked ab about you know flu. We've got information on other infectious diseases, but is that relevant? So how can we ask, how can we collect the right phenotypic information at this point and then run the computes that we need to to find out what's relevant for, for COVID-19? And then our therapeutics team, you know, we have antibody experts in-house. What are the right things? Can, can we use what we have to, to build it? So we're, be, we're, we're thinking through this. Um, I'm actually really impressed with the pace of science around, around COVID-19 um, in the Bay Area beyond globally the rate of publication has been really impressive. Um, you know, vaccines and trials already. Uh, lots, of, lots of great stuff going on. So how do we power this research? There's a lot of data here. And my team, we are folks in the background. We are the people that nobody really thinks about. We deal with the data. We manage it. We store it. We figure out how to move it around and make it accessible. Uh, and we build machine learning uh, platforms for researchers to use. So what does our data look like? So we've got cloud-backed platform on AWS. Uh, it's built to serve 10 million plus genotypes, 2 billion plus phenotypes for our consumer product and research arms. 
uh, we have big data processing pipelines, we have databases that have to make this data available in a usable way to different teams. So we think about capacity, reliability, and speed for a growing customer base. And we, we monitor and evaluate hundreds of machine learning models all the time. And we're GDPR compliant. And we're recently, um, there's a board in California that we have to have, it's similar to GDPR, but it's called CCPA, California Consumer Product something. Um, we have to be compliant for CCPA as well, which there's, a, th there's actually a lot of work that needs to be put in place to make sure that we're fully compliant. Uh, so here's our platform, uh, data and research infrastructure. I, I, you know, it was hard to know how much detail to go into for this talk. I understand there's folks who are really interested on the genetics side, some people who are interested on the machine learning side and the infrastructure side. So I'm trying to sort of balance that. Um, but if you want me to dig deeper into any of this, please ask me later on. I'm trying to sort of be a little bit more general. But you know, our businesses are at the top there. We've got consumer health and ancestry, and then we've got therapeutics. And then my team worries about this stuff right here. Our data services, compute services, machine learning service, and then how that interfaces with our product. And you know, product could be a, a lot of the things that we build. So, and then how does data science work at 23 Me, there's, there's different areas of data science. So we've got our ancestry algorithms. So where are you from in the world? Where are you from in Italy? Where are you from in China? Um, and who are your relatives? So those are different sets of algorithms which tell you who your relatives are uh, because we look at DNA segments and then who, which part of the world you're from where we're looking at different population reference panels, for example. And then we've got health related algorithms and here is where we are making predictions on what you're susceptible to. Those health reports I talked about before, these are the types of algorithms we use here. We use a lot of statistical genetics and we have spent a lot more time investing in polygenic risk score models. And we've built a machine learning platform to be able to generate these models rapidly. Target discovery. This is also very much built on the statistical genetics pipelines that we have and also um, our therapeutics folks are interested in polygenic risk scores as well for therapeutics, but there's also a lot of computational biology and stuff that goes on that I'm not going to talk about here, um, just with respect to the time that we have. Um, ancestry, so, you know, here's an example of what our uh, ancestors, one of our ancestry products looks like. It's your family tree. Uh, it's based on the bonsai algorithm. And we, you know, try to figure out uh, who, based on DNA segments, um, is uh, you related to. And we are, we are getting, we, our algorithms continue to evolve and improve. Sometimes we get it wrong, we get your relatives wrong, um, but we continue to evolve uh, and improve on this. And then we try to predict where in the world you're from. And this has become a much richer data set. We use public data, we use our own data, and then we um, use reference panels. We use your uh, genealogy as well to figure out who, where your great grandparents, your grandparents, uh, what do their genes look like and how do they relate to the reference panels that we have for different parts of the world. It's massive because we look at segments of DNA. So this is a company where I've actually gotten the chance to work with very large data sets. Um, and so when we say big data, this is genuinely big data. Our ancestry uh, database gets 6 billion rows every night. Um, so the, just the scale of this is something that uh, I've learned a lot from, uh, how to sort of deal with this kind of data um, and how do you make this kind of data usable. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of this is leveraging AWS EMR, or we use Spark for a lot of these things. We have different types of algorithms um, that we try to optimize based on what the data looks like and how it's formatted. Um, and our, alg our ancestry um, computes and pipelines are, uh, I would say, relatively sophisticated and they taken, uh, you know, they have to be managed uh, and they need to be updated and upgraded often to be able to handle the scale of data that we're looking at. 
um, health. Okay, I, I don't know how much time I have, but I'm gonna try and wrap it up in like the next 10 minutes. So there's time. If I'm over time, please let me know. Uh, so what do we do about health? How do we use that data, the genotype data that we get? And we don't sequence people, so we genotype, which is a more coarse grain uh, look at your uh, genome. Uh, so we don't have every base pair. Uh, but we, with the genotype data that we have, uh, we run genome-wide association studies, GWASs. So we look for, for example, those who said they have Parkinson's and those who said they do not have Parkinson's, how does their uh, genotypes differ? And so based on that, we look for specific markers, these SNPs, for example, that are different across those who are cases and across those who are controls. We also run another type of analysis, FIWAS, uh, which is phenotype-wide association study. And this is where we look for commonalities across disorders. So, you know, a specific SNP could be implicated in your sneeze reflex and type 2 diabetes and Parkinson's and a bunch of other things. So th this allows us to see the, the patterns across disorders with respect to markers, which that later could become drug targets. This is just getting into the details a little bit more. Um, GWAS can help us illuminate highly variable genetics. So um, here, if you look at like a monogenic trait, caffeine jitters, there is um, one variant that is, uh, it's very clear that one variant is responsible for your caffeine jitters. So these we refer to as monogenic uh, disorders, but there are some things like uh, hypothyroidism, for example, that are highly polygenic. So we can't really say which uh, variant is responsible, but there's many common variants that contribute smaller effects uh, to this aggregate. Uh, the hypothesis is that polygenic diseases have a stronger environmental component. Um, and we do a lot of modeling on, for polygenic traits. Um, and we've been thinking a lot about that lately. So polygenic risk scores, PRS, uh, you know, this is the thing where each person has multiple variants that prevent or enhance the manifestation of a polygenic phenotype. So we uh, are looking at how do we build a platform to be able to predict your risk of disorders. So we collect the data, this is what the flow looks like, we collect the data, we run the GWAS, and then the GWAS allows us to identify the variants that are implicated in that disorder. And then we run some machine learning models based on those variants. And then we come up with a risk score that we make available through our product. And then we also make that available to other therapeutics teams. So this is, you know, it's data-driven disease risk prediction, essentially. And this is important for health and prevention. And we want to make more use of that. Like what I was saying about the digital health opportunity these days, we need to think more about how do we help people prevent more? How do we tell people who are at risk to, you know, do the right things or take specific medication or when is the right time to see a doctor? So it's a combination of your genetics, your lifestyle and the environment. We run machine learning models and then we make those reports available. We're taking in a lot of lifestyle information um, as part of our surveys. So these are the phenotypes we collect. And we also are thinking a lot about how do we integrate environmental data into these models. Here's our PRS platform. I can't get into too much details. Uh, this is what our legal team would let me show you. Uh, but you know, we've got a bunch of data services. So the databases that um, my team and some other teams work on. And then we run GWAS. We have a training service for model building. We have tracking of all our models. We use MLflow, which is open source. And then we evaluate those models. The best one that we select for a certain disorder will be made available to either health reports or therapeutics or clinical studies. And we do a lot of sort of feedback with our uh, consumer base. And we did a recent study um, of a subset of our customers. And the results showed that, um, fortunately, genetic results can trigger a behavior change. So, and this survey was taken six months post the result viewing. So it's sustained behavior. And we are seeing that folks are saying, yes, 
based on what I saw on these reports, I have changed my behavior. And that's important. So that has been encouraging to us to continue to think about how do we work on the prevention side as, as well as the treatment side. Okay, and uh, the last part I'm going to talk about is drug discovery. So how do we use this genotype and phenotype data um, for our therapeutics team with our collaboration with GSK? How do you go from GWAS to drug targets? So GWAS allows you to identify variants that are implicated in certain disorders. Uh, then our research team does a lot of sort of downstream bioinformatics work and annotations and EQTL and um, to sort of help uh, identify whether or not that variant is part of a gene that is important for uh, a potential for it becoming a potential drug target. Uh, so, but there's a lot of false things in there, like not many GWAS hits become actual drug targets. And there's a lot of criteria that we have. So we have a filtering mechanism. We start with thousands of hits and then we filter that down slowly with lots of different types of analysis. Um, we look at the competitive landscape. We talk to GSK about things they may be interested in. And then we come up with a, a drug targets and then we decide together, is this a program we want to move forward with or not? Um, and we've been fortunate that our data set has and our research teams have been able to generate a lot of targets. Our job now is to uh, do risk analysis on those potential targets and see which ones are the right ones to move forward with. Um, here's a little bit of a, a figure on, you know, risk of Alzheimer's disease, how many people have this gene, and then these are sort of the genes that uh, we find could be implicated. Um, same with Parkinson's. And then based on, this is some of the information we look at to decide what are the, uh, uh, the genes that we want to focus on. And there's a lot of options out there. So how do you limit that? How do you work on the right thing? Because clinical studies, clinical trials are very expensive. So what are other machine learning opportunities that we have in this space? And this is something that um, I'm continuing to sort of uh, talk to our teams about and drawing up strategies for is, uh, you know, continue to work on target identification and validation, gene-gene interactions and epistasis mapping, um, obviously the design of the molecules themselves, uh, clinical trial stratification, we spend a lot of time on clinical studies and trials, <clears throat> and then getting into prescription history and response and responsiveness to drugs generally. So our journey so far, um, has been the company is around 13 or 14 years old. Uh, we had a huge growth in our database about a few years ago. Um, and now really our focus has been to generate value from that data. So we have a unique data catalog, models based on genetics and phenotypic data, enable us to build personalized products for prevention and treatment. And then um, infrastructure has taken time to build and it continues to evolve. And this is, you know, this is what my area is is that infrastructure is critical to enabling your teams to use the data and to benefit from that data. Um, so we continue to think about what are the right environments for the data, what are the right databases, the formats, uh, what are the right platforms for machine learning that we should be building, <clears throat> where do we need to focus, um, and how do we do feature engineering, for example, building the right workflows uh, and all of that. So infrastructure is critical, data is critical, um, and we continue to work on uh, evolving both of those. <clears throat>